Have you ever wondered, can you communicate directly with spirit guides, teachers, or non-physical consciousness, or even our higher selves? What would they tell us? My name is Kevin Moore, and since 2015, I started to practice a form of communication which is termed channeling. I have been interviewing experts on my talk show to find out, does life continue after we die? And can we communicate with those that have crossed over? With each expert I spoke to, they all had different ideas. Is there knowledge from the past which could be shared with the present moment? So I thought, why not just speak to the non-physical world directly through channelers around the world? And that's what I set out to do. They call us channelers will take the viewers on a journey into the phenomena known as channeling. And my main goal with this docu-series is to bring a new understanding and awareness to channeling by looking within ourselves and asking, is it truly possible that we can all use this innate ability? Barry, thank you so, so much for joining us. You're so welcome. And it's a pleasure to actually be interviewing you in person because previously we did it over video. Mm -hmm. And um, I never dreamt that I'd be sat here with you right now. How strange reality creation is. Yes. <laughs> uh, but this is fantastic. And thank you for coming on to be a part of the documentaries that I'm doing and, uh, you know, to, to come on to talk about the Seth work as well. So to begin with, um, Prior to going to Jane's classes, you was always on a spiritual journey, always seeking? Yeah, I was on my own spiritual journey and, and seeking. I, I didn't seek out Seth class or anything. My friends found out about it and they told me. And it sounded positive, so, so I went up to it. And everything there fit into what I was, the foundation I was building. I already felt that the universe was good and that people were good. So it filled in a lot of dots, it connected things like under the surface. But uh, it, I continued, it wasn't a, uh, there was not like a stop and a starting, let's say, with the Zeth class. It just was a continued journey. Had you come across channeled material before? No, I don't think so. The only, I, the things I read that, not spiritual, I guess, but, uh, you know, there was um, Plato and, and Aristotle and, there was a book, I didn't read the whole book, but it was about the reincarnation of life. It was a famous book, I can't, I can't even think of it now. The, but it was, a, it was a book about someone who was reincarnated. And then there was like um, Joseph Campbell, and he wrote about the hero journey and stuff like that. No, but I didn't, wasn't thinking in terms of channel material. This is back in you know, the late 60s, mid 60s, late 60s. When you first saw um, Jane... Carlos Castaneda, I'm sorry, that was a book, and you know, things like that. So when you first saw Jane Channel, was that a, a little disturbing Nothing for you? It was weird. No, it wasn't disturbing. Everything seemed very natural. Everything just fit right in. The idea of a Seth-type entity or being coming through made total sense. Everything just made sense. It was like talking to you. You know, you, it makes sense that you're sitting there and you're speaking. Yeah, so there, there was nothing in the process that was unusual or shocking or anything. What was Jane like as a person? Jane was very f friendly, and funny, uh, bubbly in her way. Uh, you know, she wore, the, she wore glasses that she took off when she was Seth. She smoked, uh, you know, she cursed in a normal fashion, not, not, not horribly so, not a little bit. And the, the lights were always on in the room. Um, you know, it wasn't a spirit, quote unquote spiritual setting. There was wine, the people smoked, there was a lot, you know, loud noise or people arguing. And again, I'm repeating it about the lights being on because it wasn't that kind of spooky, you know, we have to turn the lights off and thing. You know, Seth said that the, the spring is a cult. And so, and everything is a cult. And you don't need darkness, you know. What you need is nature, which is people. I mean, we're, we're nature. So, 
Yeah, and, and Jane was a very nice person from my interactions. I've, I've never heard anyone say anything bad about her either. And, and Robert, how, how, what was Robert like? Robert, I met him less, but he, he was quieter, but very nice and friendly. I only met him, he would come to class sometimes and sit in. And then sometimes when we wrote afterwards, after I left class and after class ended, he would sometimes communicate, like I'd write Jane and he would, he would write back. Uh, very nice guy. You know, in, in the Seth tape, there's an interview at the beginning. Um, I, I redid the Seth tape. I should give you a copy because I re-edited the Seth video um, because the interviewer is waving his arms like this, like a helicopter. I did the interview and put it in chronological order and inserted questions. And I had Richard Dickey, uh, Kendall, he read, I had him read the question, you know, and then, then it cut to them answering it. So I cut out the interview guy who was waving his hands all over the place. So it's in that interview, what I'm getting at, you get a good idea of their personalities of Jane and Rob's. In the Seth video, you can get it, except the, the interview is really annoying, you know, to me, the way he, the way he did that. But you, you get their personalities there. Both of them were nice, artistic, friendly, uh, you know, loving. And Seth? Seth would be the same. Seth was louder. And so he said he was loud on purpose to, to emphasize that personality doesn't end. You know, and you living people should be teaching me about, uh, you know, the vibrance of life. I shouldn't be the other way around. The thing that impressed me the most about Seth was somebody would come to class and would say or do something that the members or didn't like, or some of them didn't like. And we would say, oh, that's stupid, or, you know, or we'd think this guy's an idiot or a moron. But Seth would come through and express exactly what we were trying to say, but say it in a way that kind of complimented the person, made the person feel good about themselves still, but yet got the point across that we'd ineptly and in a kind of insulting fashion that we were trying to get across. And that's what impressed me the most about him, that he had this ability to not hurt, not hurt somebody, to, to not water down anything, but to be able to say something in such a way that it can make you feel good about yourself, you know, even though he's still challenging you. Was it difficult to keep up with it? Because when I watched some of the original uh, recordings back of uh, Jane Channeling, uh, there's a, obviously a lot to take in, um, but obviously, you know, it's, it's a very, it's a, it can be um, the way that she expressed the, 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 the language of Seth uh, was very sort of um, dramatic as well sometimes, wasn't it? No, it was very dramatic. He, he would speak low, he'd speak loud. Um, he had a booming voice when he wanted. But um, the, the, so he would speak in the class and then it would end. You know, Seth would put away. Sometimes Seth would sit out there still, which I liked. That was one of my favorite parts of the class too. When Seth stopped speaking, but he was still there. When he'd be like you or me. Now, he would just be like one of the people. And we'd be discussing what he said, but he would still be there. Like enjoying the, the conversation. But when Jane would put her glasses back on, you know, she would always call on somebody, but what did Seth say? And I was, I dreaded, and I was never called on, I think, because I dreaded it so much, because my mind would go blank. I knew I'd say I have no idea. Even if I had an idea, if I had to speak it in front of everybody, I wouldn't have but, but say anything. But the thing is, getting back to what Seth said, we would discuss in class what he said. And if Seth had to make a correction or add to it, he'd come back. And then the next week, when we came to class, because it was once a week, the next week, this guy named you made, typed up a transcript. So the first thing they did was they handed out the transcript to everybody. And then we reviewed the transcript. So whatever we might have missed, we always had time the next week to get it. Because the classes were four hours. You know, they were long. I'm like that, right? When I listen back to channel material sometimes, it's, it's, I'm like, what did they say? When people say, what did they say? I'm like, I haven't got a clue. Yeah. But yeah, when you read the transcripts, um, then you can take it in. But it's like that because the energy is different when they come in. There's an energy about it and there's so much, and it's, it's so mind expanding sometimes that you've got to really think about what's being said and to get, you know, for, for you to sort of, you know, Dude, feel it as well. I never That's had the, any outrageous thing, well, like you're saying that Seth said, I just never got struck with that. Everything just made natural sense. Anything about simultaneous time, about, 
It, your dreams continue after you wake up. You know, you, they, they go on about infinite probable realities. Nothing was seemed unusual. A lot of people say that about the Seth books also when they read them. They say it's like a remembering of things as opposed to a learning of new things. It's kind of like a, a remembering. So yeah, so I never had that, that feel. I understand that feeling, but I never had that. So what, were the, what was the main point of the classes? I think the main point of the classes was to get students to realize that they had the answers inside them, that there's nothing wrong with them, they're perfect with their imperfections, that they don't need the class, that they only feel they need the class because they feel there's something lacking in them and there isn't. You know, and then I guess also giving out this information to help well, that you create your own reality was a big deal. You know, you're not a victim and you create your own reality. And then uh, figuring out why you're creating what you're creating, like the, the lady said, you know, what your beliefs are behind it. In this whole Seth material, from what I put together, rereading the books and transcripts, I believe the purpose of the whole Seth material is what I call the full secret. And the secret as it's known, the secret in all the books, to me, it's only half the secret. And that first half of the secret is that you create your own reality via the law of attraction. That's the first half. The second half is that in so doing, you are to help and not harm others. And once you learn that, both, both halves, then you leave the reincarnational cycle behind and then you go on to these other real realities that are non-physical. But in helping and not harming others, that's not an obligation. If our nature is love, compassion, and goodness, acting in harmony with one's nature brings a joy. And when you help others and you don't harm others, the motivation is it brings you joy. So you don't, if you felt obligated to help others, you could resent the people you're helping. You could say, well, I don't want to, and I'm a bad person because I'm not doing it. But if you could just try to understand yourself and explore yourself and understand your beliefs, naturally your authentic self would start coming out and you would naturally help others because it felt good. If you're feeling like this is what I'm supposed to be doing because we're hardwired to help, so to speak. And I think that the whole purpose of the Seth class is if you put it all together in different places, is, is, is to you do create your own reality and you want to act in harmony with your nature. And when that's done, you, you don't have to be reincarnated anymore. You move on to the next plane or, or whatever, where, where, real, where uh, reality creation is instantaneous. You know, we have a time lag. And the purpose of the time lag here is so we can make mistakes. And everything we think we don't have to do and it doesn't happen and there's not devastation, you know. We want the whole town to die. The whole town doesn't die. You know, and there's time to make things up. Seth has something, it's, what, it's the least discussed concept of the Seth material. And I don't think many people even are aware of it. But it's a crucial part of the Seth material. And it's called um, natural guilt and violations. And people think, oh, you shouldn't feel guilty and violations. You can't violate, nobody's a victim. It has nothing to do with that. Natural, natural guilt is the way you feel when you don't act in harmony with your love, compassion, and goodness. And a violation, it's not a violation of another person, it's a violation of your own um, love, compassion, and goodness. You're violating your own nature. And that whole concept that we, we've instilled that in ourselves, this natural guilt and violations, in order to make the compassion of animals that's more instinctual, to make it conscious in us. And all that is tied into um, um, linear time because natural guilt kicks in when you're going to repeat a harmful act. So if I did something and it hurt someone and now I'm going to do it again, there's a pause. There's like a moment of reflection. It could be a second or whatever. But that pause gives you the inner tugging that let, gives your instincts your, your, a chance to come in and say, don't do it again. And you need the time lag. And that's why we needed physical reality, because we already had non-physical reality. You know, in Seth terms, it's called F2, framework two. We needed F1, what they call framework one, physical reality, to be different from non-physical reality, because we, we already had non-physical reality. 
non-physical reality doesn't have a time lag. You just, things just get destroyed. Also in physical reality, we needed vulnerability. Matter had to be able to be destroyed because that's how you learn compassion. You don't have to, you don't learn compassion if nothing, if you know what you do know deep, deep down inside that nothing is ever destroyed. But, um, so we needed physical reality for its, all of its differences. What a lot of people in the New Age stuff do is they try to turn f physical reality into non-physical reality, like minimize the differences as if non-physical reality is this higher plane that's, that's real, but physical reality isn't real because it's an illusion and it's whatever. But physical reality isn't, is real, it's just one aspect of reality. And all the things that they don't like about it when they say it's not like F2, that's why we created it. We created it for its vulnerability, for its linear time. So it'll be, you know, you can't say you could say time doesn't exist, or it's all simultaneous. No, but for us, I'm going to meet you at one o'clock, and you're not going to go. Well, time doesn't exist, and I'll go. Yeah, you're right, and we'll never see each other again. You know. So it's a question of accepting physical reality. Well, you look at the people attracted to spiritual information, and most people I've come across have, don't want to be here. They, it's they, because I think they don't want the pain. They don't want, I mean, there's joy and pain. You learn from joy, you learn from the pain. But the idea of heaven, even if it's not the heaven of the Bible, it's some other version of heaven that everything's going to be fine and it's very appealing. So who would want to put, you know, who would want to wake up in the morning and have to go to the bathroom put your shoes and socks on if you could fly around the galaxy you know and in the dream state we're part of what we're doing is flying all over the place so it's very appealing but to be here is and be present is really important if we didn't want to be here we wouldn't be here we die matter of fact when I, I read the trial and death of Socrates by Plato and they talked about death in that for one moment I remember I was 15 and in one moment he convinced me that uh, that you shouldn't be afraid of death, and it's okay. I got this horrible pain in my stomach. And I said, no, no, I changed my mind. Uh, it's okay, I don't want to die. And it went away. But if that, what that told me back then, and it confirmed with things I've read since, is that if we didn't want to be alive, we wouldn't be. You never have to commit suicide, because if you didn't want to be alive, you'd just die. But people do commit suicide. Because they're, they're imposing their you know, pain, their, their, their actions into it. But they still want to be alive or else they wouldn't have to commit suicide. How much of the Seth teachings are you living, do you think? Okay, first I'm going to say that nobody needs a Seth. There are people who don't know how to read, there are people who, who don't, and, and they are, if you want to say, living Seth's message. They're in tune with nature, they, they go fishing, they sit on the back porch, they enjoy the night air. So you don't need Seth, and there's no really Seth message to live because Seth's message is really up about the process of reality creation. It's like the mechanism. It's what's going on. The, and then, I guess now to counter what I just said, there's a parts of Seth's message that isn't that. Well, that might be. But the idea of that you not, shouldn't hurt other people and that people are uh, you know, innately loving and good, etc. Um, and things like that. I would think that, uh, you know, follow the Seth, uh, again, I, don't, I, I hesitate calling it Seth message because it's an ancient message. It was said through Seth, and a, a lot of it I had on my own, and a lot I got from Seth. Uh, but I know that when my, my son was, was killed in a hit and run in 1996, and that was the first really real test I had. Do I believe any of this stuff? Like that you're not a victim, death is no end. And the beliefs that I had, wherever you want to say they came from, but they were certainly in the Seth material, totally carried me through that whole thing. I didn't feel that I was a victim. I didn't feel that he was a victim. I looked for reasons why it happened. You know, what, what you know, it made me ask questions and get answers that I wouldn't have even asked or got if I didn't, you know, believe that things happened for a reason. Um, so there's something else, but I'll remember it uh, at some point. So, so it carried through with that, uh, you know, completely. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Um, 
And how many times did you interact with Seth, do you think? Uh, I was in class for about a year. Um, I don't know, about 10, 12, I don't, I don't know. I, uh, you know, different times. There was different times, and also some Mary, you know, sometimes Seth would comment on something I said, and I don't know if that's quite an interaction. Then other times I would ask a question. But I was shy in class. I, my, the kept message I always kept getting was, you know the answers already. And I felt hesitant to ask a question because I wanted to figure it out. And then I would be mad at myself later sometimes for not asking more questions. But, um, yeah, so, I mean, I was just like a regular member, interacted normally, I guess. But when it was your time to go, you knew it was your time and you never looked yeah. back. When I left class, over a period of time, you know, which means a period of classes, I don't know how long, the message I kept leaving with, regardless of everything else that happened, was that <clears throat> you have the answers. If you ask me, you're only getting half the answer and you're going to stop looking, thinking you got the whole answer. By asking the question, that's a flag telling yourself that inside you is the answer. Um, you know, and, and that's what I kept walking out of Jane's house with over and over again. I, I already have the answers. I, I should ask myself. I should not. And when that happened enough, I, I stopped going to class. Yeah. But you kept in contact with Jane, like I kept you said. in contact with Jane. I wrote her cards, she, you know, letters, she'd write back stuff. I, I have those. And I stayed in contact with my friends. You know, we were in the Sue's books called The New York Boys. And we were all like, you know, like hippie type people. And it was uh, 1972, uh, with long hair and stuff. And these were my friends. These were the people I grew up with. So I've, I stayed in touch with them as well. But I didn't, I, I stopped going to class sometime in, uh, after about, I started in October of 72. So sometime later, I don't know, I don't know the exact time, but sometimes that's when I stop. But, you know, they still went. I mean, you look at the lives that the Seth material has touched, and it, it's become one of the, the more famous uh, channel texts. And um, I guess you never knew at the time just how big it was going to be. I never did. Other people did. But it, it's, you never hear, I never hear, when I hear, like in this documentary, that Seth is going to be mentioned. But usually, Seth doesn't, in The Secret, I don't think Seth's name or Jane came up, Anything I hear, I'm, I'm looking for Seth to be mentioned at all, and I never, never hear it. Sometimes in the back of a book or in the beginning of someone's book, they might mention, you know, thanks to the Seth material and on a list. So it's an underground thing almost. It's not, it should be on TV. It should be, you know, like The Secret was around. There's a movie on it. And I believe, you know, it really should be. I have to put should in quotes because it's not an accident that it's not, but it should be in quotes. In everybody in the public discourse, everybody should know about it, and and people don't. Even Oprah Winfrey started to read one of the books. She put it down because it was too much for her. Yeah. But she, a load of big names that I've come across, maybe wouldn't admit it, but they've they've come across it, mm -hmm. and it started them on their spiritual there, path. There were three names that I know. One is Richard Bach, who wrote um, Jonathan Livingston Siegel. He actually came to a class once, but I wasn't there. Anyway. He came to class once, and, and you know, he met Seth and everything. There was a singer called Phoebe Snow, and I heard in some interview she had mentioned Seth. And then Robert Downey Jr., I also read some interview where he had mentioned Seth. Now, I'm sure there are more. Uh, I, don't, I don't really know. But those are the three I heard of, the three famous people. But unfortunately, um, from my perspective, you know, Jane shunned publicity. She really didn't want it. I think she didn't want to, think, I think she once joked about being middle-aged and didn't want to be called like middle-aged woman or something. But, you know, but she, may, so she didn't push it. And that, that kept the set material down, you know. But you know, that's just the way it is. Where's the original uh, writings right now? Are they at, at some university? Or? Yeah, I forget the university, but Mary Dillman, Mary Dillman, it might be Yale. There's a, a woman... Uh, Mary Dillman, who's in charge of it, somebody donated all the papers to, um, I think it was Yale University. So she, she's a librarian, like supreme, and she puts things in boxes, like labels, goes out. She speaks at Seth conventions, gives them things she discovered. Uh, and people could go visit it, I think. You know, I think you might have to make an appointment and stuff.
But most of the Seth material has been released. There's not much that hasn't been released as now. As far as I know, there was the official books. Those were, I don't know, 10 books, let's say. Then there are books that are called the early sessions. The first official Seth book was Seth Speaks. And let's say that was session 500 or 502, whatever it was. The early sessions are from session one, which was when Seth first came through the Ouija board, up to session, you know, 501. What made them document it all? Um, at one point, they started on the Ouija board. Jane was writing a book about ESP. She didn't really believe in this stuff, but she was a science fiction writer, and she, was, she thought it was great. Like the idea of reincarnation, she thought it was a great technique, you know, something as a writer you could write about. So maybe they started documenting it for her book. The, um, then they continued, I imagine, because they really were intrigued by what was being said. So the first session would be in the early session one, and that's whatever they picked up from the Ouija board. Then eventually Jane started to get the urge to speak the words. And then the early sessions, I think there are nine volumes, goes up to, let's say, session 501, and then session 502, is the first session of Seth Speaks. And then there's something called the personal sessions, which they used to be called the deleted sessions, which I happen to like better. And it's stuff that during the official dictation for the book, there were things that were deleted from those sessions. I guess they were personal things. So there would be, you know, let's say session 706 would be, you know, it's five pages long, but it was really eight pages, but they removed three because it, it wasn't part of the book dictation. So all of these deleted sessions were put into seven books called the personal sessions. So there's the, the, the personal sessions, there's the early sessions, and then there are the official Seth books, and then there are the class transcripts. And right now there's four books of that that came out from f class first began in you know, maybe 1967, or I don't know exactly, up until, I think it covers up until 71 or something, the, the, those transcripts. The rest of the transcripts aren't in book form yet. So there is some stuff that's... There's, st it's not in book form. Now, the other transcripts, people have them and post them and they talk about them. But as far as books go, they're not, pub you know, they're not published as a book. So Seth addresses you as uh, the, the poet... Yeah, when I, I read a few poems, so when I went to class, um, the first time, the very first class I went to was one of the rare times where Seth didn't come through at all. So I sat on the couch, it was an interesting discussion. You know, sometimes there's like, there could be like 10 to 35 people there, or 40. Or The second class I went to, Seth did come out. But when Seth, at the end of the class, Seth, Seth said, and goodbye to our poet over here. So I just took it to me, you know, because I read poems. Some people think it means something more like because, you know, he knows more about people and, you know, and my poems are all the things that that, that lady said, whatever her name, Cass lady, and that Seth said is how I write the poems. It, it's, it's, uh, sometimes they're conscious, sometimes they're subconscious, and the best ones or sometimes are, it's like a dance, like a choreography between the intuition and intellect. But I explore a lot of these Seth ideas, not thinking of them in terms of Seth ideas. But I, even before I ever heard of Seth, you know, the poems would include Seth ideas. Um, and then certainly after the class as well. But So um, I think I see myself as some kind of like a poet speaker because I have, you can see the poems back there, I got over 4,000 poems, very prolific, a lot. I think they're great, you know, not every single one. But some of them, when I read them, and I, you know, as like, oh, I'm a person reading it, they really are great, I think. Um, and they're also very, some of them are very deep and spiritual and, uh, you know, so, yeah. So he referred to me as our poet. So I like to think of it as our poet, meaning our, our poet of our, of our movement, you know. And obviously you've uh, had a book out. Yeah, called um, Outside is the Secret Key. It's one, it's 100 poems, but I would I'd like to put out at least 40 more books. That would be 4,000 poems, if not that many, you know, just less. You know, and Jane was a poet. She had two poetry books out. I did go to some of her poetry classes. I lived in Elmira. That's where the classes were. I moved up there for a few, about six months or something. So I went to some of her poetry classes, too, and those were fun. Seth never came through, unfortunately. 
But, you know, I, Sue told me that both she liked my poems and, and Jane wrote me about how she liked my poems. But, you know, I'm, I'm like 22 at the time. And obviously I only wrote poems up until 1972 then, or 1973, because that's all, that, that's all that existed in linear terms. So since 1973 and 74, 75 even, when class was still going on, the 75, 85, 95, you know, there's 30 plus years of poems that continued after uh, class and then after Jane died, etc. But um, yeah, so I am the poet. Obviously there's a lot more channelers out there nowadays. Um, bringing this up to- I'm gonna interrupt you, I'm sorry. The word channel, I found that, Seth used that term back in the early, mid 60s. I thought it was a new term, like, oh, they're coming up with a new term for medium. They're calling them channelers or channelers. I don't think he said channeler, but he repeatedly, at, well, at different times, used the word channel. And it's not a new term, which I, that's just my own personal thing. I thought it was. But it, but it, 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 it had come out before the Seth material. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. people used it before then, I yeah. don't know. But I know Seth used it in like 64, 65. He used the term. So when you... Mm. Um, so you're saying about new channel, channels yeah, today yeah. or something? Is there any other channelers that resonate with you, apart from Seth? You know, Seth's a hard act to follow, because Jane was very poetic, and Seth, I turned some of Seth's quotes into poems. You know, they're called found poems, so I'll say the thing, I'll say found poems, Seth. And he was very human and very down to earth when he wanted to be. Um, so when you combine the down to earth quality the poetic quality, and then the kind of earthy quality where he cursed sometimes, like he talked about the word shit and the word fuck and why people don't like it and they should like it. Um, that's one of the things I'm giving you here. Uh, he's a hard act to follow because the material itself made so much sense to me and he said, and it's not because he said it was, you know, as pure as the material could be, but it felt that way to me. I mean, somebody else could say that and I could say, it doesn't sound that way to me. But, every, but it did sound that way to me. So I, fortunately or unfortunately, use Seth sometimes as a gauge, if that's not the right word, I don't know. And I'll compare other people, like are they gonna mention anything like uh, artificial guilt, natural guilt, and, you know, violations? What do they say about simultaneous time? So I kind of measure it up to that, you know, to, to judge the quality of that material. Um, surprisingly enough, there was a, his name was Davis, 1800s. He was called the Seer of Poughkeepsie, and it was like 1850 to 1904. Uh, Jefferson Davis, Jefferson, I forget, uh, Davis was the name, the rest of it I can give you. He included more Seth stuff in it than, than m most people today. Instead of saying framework one and framework two, he had sp sphere one and sphere two. He's the only one that I ever heard besides Seth that does talk about an equivalent of uh, our natural guilt and violations that's included in there. So his material I like really a lot. He used Christian terms, but he gave them new definitions. So if you just look at it, you think he's, talk oh, he's talking about the Bible and he's talking about this, but he's not. He'll use those terms, but if you read what he means by them, they're not involved really with Christianity at all. But those were the terms. He also wrote books, dictated books came out. He did questions. He went a lot giving questions and answers to audiences. So he's somebody, you know, that, uh, that I really liked a lot, uh, Davis, and I can't think of it, some kind of Southern type name, like, you know, some kind of Civil War type name. Um, and he was around before and after the Civil War. So he talks about war and stuff, and it's like the Civil War hasn't happened yet, and then it's ongoing. But there was some, there's a person named Emmanuel who wrote three little small books. I remember reading those, and I thought those were pretty good. I'm not too fond of Elias that people love. Um, in my mind, Elias is too focused on non-physical reality and doesn't give the importance of, you know, like you might say, I'm, I'm paraphrasing poorly now, but he'll say, you know, physical reality is an illusion. He wouldn't say it that, but something that I would translate into that. Instead of giving the credence more See, I see Seth is really holding up, on the one hand, you know, like Atlas holds up the world. I think Seth holds up physical reality and non-physical reality is like equal. The soul, you know, the, the flesh, the soul and the flesh are one. 
nature and the spirit are one. That you don't, you can't separate them. And that would be something like Seth would say. So I would say when Elias talks about things, it's a little slanted more towards you know, there's no such thing as murder because nobody ever dies. But that's giving F two too much importance and not and underplaying it. And uh, he's a little difficult to understand. Uh, he says he's difficult on purpose, so people have to work at it. You know, I don't know. I have mixed questions. Some people love him. Comes out all the time. So I, w I would say off the top of my head is really a manual now. You know who was interesting? You had them on the show. I don't know what quite to make out of them, but that Eric person, it's not quite, I don't know if it's channeling. Oh, the one who channeled for, the one that brought Eric through, you know, Eric the kid. And there was a channel that used to work Jamie with them Bubba. much more. Yeah, yeah. She seems to be good from what the level she works at. Now, I don't mean that in a negative way. I think she can work on different levels. I think she chooses not to. But things she seemed to have said when I was following her in, in that, that show, I, I liked her. The interesting thing about that is that it, it makes sense when I listen to it, but it seems unbelievable when you hear about it. Like, all right, here's Adolf Hitler. Oh, we'll bring Hitler in. Here's Jesus. I'm going to talk to the earth now. Bigfoot, four shows on Bigfoot or whatever. But when you listen to it, like when they said things about Hitler, it's pretty reasonable. You know, things that he, you know, he wasn't evil. He did this for these reasons. Kennedy, John Kennedy, it sounded like. So I have, you know, positive feelings towards them, although they don't get into Seth type ideas too much. They're kind of personalities. What is channeling to you? Channeling is just opening up your mind to these inner voices that are always there. And like they was, the lady was saying, and Seth had said, and, and I would say, we block it out. It doesn't fit our official reality. It comes through as intuition. It comes through as sudden inspiration. It's us talking to ourselves. It's our own inner voice. And I think if you are more attuned to it and open up to it and explore it more, you could maybe separate, even though they're not separated, you could give it another name or it's another aspect. So instead of being, you know, you know Barry in, in herself, or in your case, like Kevin and herself, because you do this, you know, that would, that would be stuff and interesting. But then there's another voice that you think is the Kevin and herself, but you find out, no, you know, you can call me William. And so I think it's another aspect of your entity, you know, that you're connected to. So it's giving information that's more outside of your experience. Because after interviewing so many channelers, there's a lot of groups out there. There's a lot of different entities speaking as one. And they're not all the same groups. Yeah. Well, I would, it makes sense that there would be different groups. There would be different, you know, like there are different people. There are different families. There are different families of uh, entities. Or... But none of those groups are really resonating with you. So, so I would well, say... Well, let me interrupt for a minute. I'm yeah. not aware of all of them. Right. So I can't really say that none, none of them are. It's it's that either, you know, like the Bashar, Bashar person, you know, I like sense of humor and stuff. There are some things I liked and I don't remember any details now and some things I didn't like, but there was nothing, you know, because I, I'm so aware of the Seth material, I guess, there was nothing grabbed me. There was nothing, wow, that's really interesting. It's just something that's, to me, not said as well. You know. But does that mean for the person that's listening to it where it's not said as well, is that the level to they're them at? it's perfect. Right. To them it might be the best thing in the world. You need each generation and each separate group of our time period now would need channelers, mediums that speak to them. You know. So if there was some Christian group that had a medium, that Christian group might use religious terms, but the message is still the same. Do you think Seth still speaks, the material still speaks to people now? If people, yeah, well, yeah, Seth, there are a lot of Seth readers. I just, again, don't think the publicity is there. I think the more people who are aware of Seth will love the material. They first have to go through not only their own ego with the type of material, but the prejudice against channeled material, which has gotten, sometimes for good reason, you know, a bad rap. A lot, you know, a lot of people take it to mean... Well, you create your own reality. There's no victim, so you shouldn't help someone who's suffering. I mean, there was a time, I don't know if people still say it, and it really infuriated me, and it got me kicked out of some groups. 
where they just said, you can't help anyone because by trying to help someone, you have to create their problem in the first place. So you, it's impossible to help someone. And if you try, you'd be creating their problem in the first place. So you're better off not even trying. There, there, and from my perspective, there are little driblets of truth in what they said, dripping up from that, or not dripping up, or dripping down from that. But um, it, the idea that you shouldn't help others because there are no victims. Someone said, if they interfered, like I said, if you knew someone was going to rape and murder a baby the next day, and you could talk to this person safely and try to talk them out of it, the person said, I wouldn't try it because I'd be interfering with the face of God. You know, on some level, I could understand they're saying things are meant, but we're here to help others. And these type of things that have drifted into the public domain, public discourse about, well, there are no victims, really comes across as cold hearted, you know, and, uh, and I was surprised that, and I used to say, oh no, that's not what it's saying. But then when I heard what other people were saying, I said, yeah, that is what they're saying. You know, not everybody, but too many people. So people have to go through that prejudice or truth, whatever it is that they feel about channeled material in the first place, then they would have to deal with the material itself. What I found is the most helpful in my life and dealing with people is I try to talk to them in their language. I don't need, I won't, well, don't have to mention Seth. If they believe in prayer, I might say prayer instead of your beliefs. But I would word things in such a way that I believe I'm getting across something helpful to them that also happens to be in the Seth material, but that's not why it's helpful, but it's in there also. And they're not even aware that I'm saying anything that's in the Seth material. Because first of all, it's not only in the Seth material, it's in the spring, it's in the, the water. What was uh, some of the outstanding parts for you of the Seth material? Um, yeah, I, I might have mentioned some before, but the idea of the, the concepts itself, I mean, of simultaneous time, that everything's happening at once. And then, you know, the way I understood that was, it's not like everything's happened. Someone says, oh, it's simultaneous, so everything's happened. No, new things happen but it gets fatter and fatter like an onion, as opposed to a single line getting longer and longer. But the idea of simultaneous time and that we, we, could, we could change our past, we, we could have a dream with our nine-year-old self, say something to the nine-year-old self, that nine-year-old self could wake up and now do something different because of that. It'll come to us now as like a memory. Like I met my nine-year-old self in a dream and I told him how great the violin was. He woke up, asked his mother for a violin, and played the violin. And I will, in my, when I wake up, I will not remember anything. I'll just say, you know, I just remembered my mother gave me a violin, and I really was good at it. So I think that we communicate and change our past, and we change the future. That's all involved with simultaneous time, that these things aren't in stone. I think that's a great idea. It was very fascinating. The idea of dreams continuing after you wake up, I thought it was fascinating. Where do they continue to? They continue. They have their own their own world. They, they're, I believe, when you have a dream, and you might have felt this. I have felt. You kind of are waking up in the dream. You're waking up in an ongoing situation. Yes. And I think it is an ongoing situation. It's non-physical, but it has its own physicality, if you will. It has its own form and plane. And then when we wake up, just how we came into it, we're coming out of it. But it's still going on. So you can switch realities to that maybe one day. If you, well, there you're talking about that. Well, I don't know if this is what you mean at all, but you know the people who do, who do lucid dreaming, they're kind of awake in the dream. Well, for example, I see that. myself in a dream having a massive talk show one day, and it's saying then saying to me that that reality out there is happening, and I'm able then to know that if I wanted that over time, because it's not going to be instantaneous, that I could switch my reality to that and build a career towards that knowing it's there you could I, I would say yeah you could then build do take actions have your beliefs in alignment take actions that attract that situation happening it could just as well happen that whatever you're getting out of the dream experience is enough for you you're getting you you might be getting what you already need because of the dream and you don't need to physicalize it you know because you're getting it already the experience you know, of just the feeling of it. Yeah, not only the feeling of it, but more than the feeling, the whole experience of it, including the feeling. That's in you now. 
That's affecting you now. So it's a bit like a holodeck where you can get to reenact things, but not actually have the outcome of, you know, the 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 the, the outcome of of whatever that would it could mean be to both. do it. Yeah, it could it, be both. you could have a dream, and in the dream, it, you could it could lead you in a direction, and it could make you become, you know, big talk show person, or as I said, you're getting enough now out of everything. You might not really need that. Right. You know, you might still want it. You might still have it. But, you know, like one of the things I remember from dreams that was really interesting to me in the Seth material, um, Jane woke up and she had a dream about a leaky tub. That's all she remembered. And then Seth explained it was, one, you, you were feeling yourself getting older and you felt your body was like a leaky tub. Two, you traveled and you visited Rob when he was d drowning on a ship in the 1700s. And, you know, you experienced that with him and watched him or whatever, and that was the leaky tub. Also, you had a friend in California whose last name is Tub. It had two Bs. She was pregnant, and she her water burst, and you visited her. And that same night, you visited your friend in California who, had the, who you hadn't spoken to in 20 years. You visited Rob while he was drowning in the 1700s, and it was telling you about your feelings and beliefs about your own body. All she remembered when she woke up was, I had a dream about a leaky tub. And this is what I think happens every single night with us, regardless of what we remember or don't remember. Why don't we remember it? Um, I asked Seth that about myself. I said, one of the classes, I said, why don't I, I remember my dreams? I tell myself to, it's gonna, it sounds stupid to me now, and it didn't then, but it did after Seth answered me. And I said, you know, I have a dream, and then I tell myself, oh, I'm going to remember it. And then I wake up and I don't remember it. Or sometimes I have a dream and I go, oh, that's not important. So I don't write it down. And he said, well, that's why you don't remember the dreams. You tell yourself they're not important or you tell yourself you're going to remember it when you know you're not going to remember it. So you have to, I had to, uh, train yourself to remember your dreams. You know, I went, I went through a big period where I have about this many typewritten dreams. Now I don't remember that much an anymore. Um, but... You train, like you train anything, like if you're a musician, you practice the, the, that, if you're a golfer, you practice. I would keep a notebook if I really wanted to, and I suggest this to anybody who wants to. Keep a flashlight, a notebook, and a pen by your bed. Whenever you wake up for any reason, write down whatever you're thinking, whatever dream you have. The more you do it, the more you remember. Like I'd remember a little bit, I'd start writing it down, I'd have five pages of dreams. What were some of the other amazing material that came that really helped you as well on that sort of um, death is that you're you're dead right now as you'll ever be death is no end consciousness continues one of the things about seth one of the concepts in the seth class that was really important besides death being no end you're as dead right now as you'll ever be you know this is death this is it was um the present is the point of power that from the present you could f change and affect whatever you want you could you don't have to he said this to somebody in class who went to a guru in India. This is a little different, but the same. You don't have to go to a guru in India. You know, you, you can do it all right now yourself. You don't need to know a past life. The present is the point of power. And that was a great, great concept. But don't we need some people sometimes just to clean a house for us? We, you know, we don't always want to do it ourselves. It's beliefs, again. You don't need somebody. You might, what you just said, we need someone because we don't want to do it for ourselves. Well, if you don't want to do it for yourself, then you will need someone. But it's not built into some kind of reality that you don't want to do it for yourself and you're going to need someone. I would say you don't need anyone, but if you believe you do, then you're going to look for others. And that's one of the reasons why people went to Seth class. They didn't, they didn't trust in their own power, so they wanted to hear it through somebody else. But I don't think we need anyone. And again, there are people who don't know how to read. They're not from uh, the, you know, America or... They're in some tribe someplace, or they are in America, and they're, they don't know how to read, or whatever, that are totally in alignment with, with the Seth material by the way they're living their lives. You know, they're, they're experiencing it, like I said, by watching clouds go by, or sitting on their porch, or going some, fishing. But some people want proof, don't they? That's up to you. What is proof? If you, want, if you need proof, if you want proof of whatever it is you want proof of, you have to have a system in place in your mind of what proof is. And then you have to have something that you're after that needs to be proved. If you feel joy watching uh, a river, 
you don't need proof. You have the joy. The joy is the proof. The joy is the spirituality. The joy is the Seth material. There's no proof needed. If, if you have a concept in mind, and you could either want proof or not, like death, you know, death being the end or not, you know, that's a tricky one because nobody could, my belief system is you can't really know for sure until you die. So you got to find a belief you could honestly believe and, and hold. But, you know, people who have uh, near-death experiences, Seth himself would be uh, a, an example of it if, if you believe that. So, what you know, do you want scientific proof? Do you want, it, it all depends. During the Seth material, was there any sort of, um, you know, quantum physics or that kind of material? Yeah, there were, there were, like, okay, probable realities, infinite number of probable realities. Now in quantum physics, it's called parallel uh, realities um, and, and string theory of all these different dimensions. So there are things that, and Seth talked about an expanding universe and ever expanding universe. There were things that Seth said that slowly quantum physics is proving. But Seth himself did not speak in physics, in terms of physics. But the idea of simultaneous things, things not existing until you look at it, it has, it, that's reality creation. So, um, for example, there's a TV on your wall over there. We're both creating that? Yeah, according, yeah, according to the Seth material, and I agree with it, there's, now there's two people in the room and we're looking at a TV on the wall. I'm, we telepathically and subconsciously agree to where the TV should be and what it should look like. I create my version of the TV in the right place. You create your version of the TV, let's say superimposed on mine. So it seems that there's one TV and two people. There's really two TVs, but we're creating, and that's with every object around everybody. Um, but at, at a distance, if I was to say, um, you know, get you to do something with that TV, like move it or whatever, you know, we'd be both be saying the same language or is, you know. You know what do you mean by move it? You well, you know, if you, but if that TV in the background, we were to do something like measure it, right, or to, 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 to describe it, we would be describing the same thing, exactly. We would think so, but maybe not, because there are always differences. That's why I think police reports come up with differences. Like they'll say the guy, you know, the guy who robbed the store had a mustache. And someone would say, well, no, he didn't have a mustache. These are things I think people created for their robber, and the other person didn't create it. So, um, you know, the, the, there are differences. Also, the idea of that we, we are create, this is the Seth idea that is also fascinating and interesting. How, you know, we create the objects around us each instant, like they're blinking in and out of reality each moment. And sometimes it actually will disappear because you're not, you're not creating it. So you're looking for your keys where, you know, you don't know where they are. And then suddenly they're not even like underneath paper, like, oh, yeah, they were underneath that. There's some place right on top where you look five times and now suddenly they're there. I believe that they actually disappeared because you didn't recreate them every instant, and then you did, and then it reappeared. So the idea that we each create, we, the objects around us, we create, we're flickering in and out of reality, in and out of physical reality each instant. Just as much as we're physical, we're not physical. Just, just as much as these things are here, they're not here. But because of our physical senses and the way we set up physical reality, they appear to be constant and appear to be here. Yeah, and you know, that, and that key or that, uh, has got a history. It was made in a manufacturing plant somewhere, you know, so there's a history to how it was produced. Yeah, that, that's the physical end of it. I'm not, that's, yeah, there's a history of how things are produced. We, yes. And the people producing it, the same process is in place, but, materializing. But, but, but you're materializing basically it. saying there that we could maybe, if we understood it, create anything with our mind. I think that uh, we do, but we wouldn't know it. But then we call, we give it a history to say it was made here, this is the year it was made. You know, or, or else it is connected to what was made. Let's say this TV, it's here now. We are now creating it over and over again. But the reason why we allow ourselves to create it over and over again is because of our belief system in the factory, in buying it, and now it's here, and it all fits in, so, so we could recreate it. That person that made it would have a belief system that he made it. Yeah, as he was making it, he would be, it happened so quickly that you don't even notice, like each instant, all the physical reality would be like this. So he's putting it together, but he's also 
materializing it. I mean, according to this level we're speaking at, physical reality doesn't exist. Going back to quantum physics, it would be like super strings or quantum foam. So right now, in nothing. this room, that door shut, I can't see outside. Right now, first of all, if you want to, on the level we're speaking, there is no room, there is no door, there are no physical bodies, nothing physically exists. It's all a, Seth uses the word camouflage, a camouflage reality. I like the term, it's a reality of appearance. Things appear to be certain ways. So if I throw a ball to you, it appears that the ball is moving to you, but I am recreating the ball like a motion picture in a different place each time. So yeah, we're creating a wall that is keeping out uh, the, the heat or the cold, and it's real and it's not real. Speaking of quantum science again, a table is solid, according to classic science, you know, you can knock on it. And according to quantum science, it doesn't exist. It's not even there. So both are real. The, but, the wall is there and works as a wall, and it's not there at all. But there's a science to all this as well. You know, we live in a reality where things are repeatable. That's belief in one type of science. Science, from my unscientific, <laughs> ignorant perspective, leaves out the whole idea of consciousness. What does consciousness do? It's not provable. It, what does consciousness do? I've, some people do experiments with random marbles, I've read about that drop, and when you put somebody in front of it, they change slightly, but they change the random quality of how it drops. So whatever is provable or not provable at first, I mean, germs weren't provable at first, and no one believed in them, but then they discovered them, quote unquote. So the thing that's missing from science is the effect of consciousness. We have the placebo effect, which is totally consciousness, but it's just not used. It's not, it's not, it's like clay that's not being built to what it really is. Was there mention in the Seth material of, you know, relationships, sex and everything? Oh, one second. I believe, by the way, that eventually uh, science, quantum science and everything, Physics and metaphysics are going to What's, join. I just had to say, it is going to. And there's, what about the molecules? They have, now science does say that th there isn't solid objects. Actually, everything's spinning and we don't yeah, see it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But, um, uh, what was I saying? So, no, no, let me just, that's fine, that's fine. We've got that, we've got enough of okay. that. That's fine, that's fine, that's fine. Yeah, no, relationships and health yeah. and well, you know, health There's and stuff. a book called um, Nature of the Psyche, something like that. Mm -hmm. And in it, Seth talks all about sexuality and says the natural state of things is bisexuality and one extreme is heterosexuality, the other extreme would be complete, 100% homosexuality, but it's all, everything's in the middle. Sex does, Seth does not, I don't know if discriminate is the right word, but discriminate about any kind of sexual act, sexual behavior, except I would assume if it's harming somebody. Um, so, you know, he, he, he's in favor of sex. He says, you know, the flesh and the, and the soul are, are one. And you hear, you know, physical reality is here to be joyful. So, no, yeah, he would not, he, the only thing he ever put down was someone who self flagel whatever, when you, when you uh, whip yourself or, or something, if you're, you're harming so, yourself. So, let me ask you something quick. So, so, Seth would say then that, that, that we're here to have fun. We're here, see, that's the tricky part. Because that's what some people say. We're here to have fun, and that then means don't worry about other people, you don't care, I'm just here to have fun, have a good time. We're here to experience joy, and ultimately the way we experience joy is by acting in harmony with our nature of love, compassion, and goodness. And that's what we're here for. So you have to follow the path of fun, and we're inner guided by following the path of our nature of love, compassion, and goodness. So when Seth says, or when anybody says, you're here to have fun and do what's fun, it's kind of a means to an end. It's not an end, in a sense, in itself. And instead of fun, and Seth said this elsewhere too about himself, I think the word joy is really a better word. But um, yeah, but you can't, you, we're here to have fun, but we're not here to have fun, if you want to use these terms now, at the expense of others and harming others. But if you act that it's okay to enjoy yourself and to have fun, eventually, without obligation, you will go on the path of helping others and not harming others. 
The near-death experience or past life regression, did Seth ever mention these? Yeah, not in those terms, I don't think. But in, as in Seth speaks, chapters 9 through 12, and it might be a little bit more than 12, but definitely chapters 9 through 12 are all about the death experience. And death is no end, what happens after you die. Um, he begins it by saying there is no real point of death, which to me, you know, what do you mean there's no point of death? This person's alive and then he's dead. But he started going into the cells, how, you know, not only every seven years, you know, like you have new cells, but they don't happen like every seven years. But your cells are constantly dying while others are still living. And they're constantly dying. And he said, that's like what death is. You're experiencing death all the time. Your consciousness doesn't end. When you die, you, 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 you no longer need the camouflage anymore. So you leave that behind. It's like going to sleep, but you know, not waking up, let's say. And then you, you're in a realm, an area of your own reality creation. So if you believe in hell, and, you, that, and that you're a sinner, you might create for yourself whatever you think hell is. And you'll experience that until somebody will come along, one of your guides or helpers, and would say, you know, you don't have to do this. And if you believe, you know, you're going to uh, meet people, you know, that you know, loving people, I think that's what naturally happens anyway. But the same way you create your own reality when you're living, you would create your own reality when you die. You know, and then there are things, you know what, what movie had, I don't even remember the name of that movie, with Albert, two movies, the one with Albert Brooks, I think, it was an after-death movie, he died and he was, it was like a comedy, I forgot the name of the movie, and also What Dreams May Come. Great movie. Both of those had a lot of Seth ideas in them. Um, each, and then they ve veered from it, like the woman committed suicide so she was suffering or, you know, that, that's not a Seth idea. According to Seth, if you kill yourself, you're just going to have to face, it's, it's not an escape. You'll just have to face whatever you're running from at another time, in another lifetime. But you don't get punished or anything for it. So I'd recommend, I'm sorry, chapters 9 through 12, Seth Speaks. Anybody listening, you want to know about the after death, read those and incorporate it into your beliefs. Keep what you want, throw away what you don't. So our, if all lives are happening now, our past lives are happening now as well, and yeah. our future lives. They'd all be happening now, and but they're not ended. They're, it's like this is our present. So from a past life, we're one of those future lives, and we're happening now. It's just all happening at once um, and connected in ways. You know, one way I envisioned this was if you imagine like a big... Uh, rag, let's say, in water, and it bubbles, you know, part of the rag you could see here and part of it, you could see parts of the rag out of the water, but the rest of the rag is under the water. Each little island of rag would be like another lifetime, another time period, yet they're all connected in ways you can't see, like under the water. What is running all this? What's behind all this? What's behind mm -hmm. Seth? Well, I don't know if it's behind Seth, but behind everything, is his consciousness. You know, when you go, one of the questions, like what's behind it, it's a good question, you know, but it, it reminds me of questions like, how did it all start, or the beginning? Answers, I think those answers are not linear. In ways we don't understand, there was no beginning and there was no end. That reality, like quantum reality, the time doesn't exist there. In ways that at least I can't understand, there's no beginning and there's no end. Everything is in some ways. And consciousness would be what it is. Now Seth describes what he calls all that is, that it wanted to express itself physically, and so it, it created physical reality. I don't know. You know, that, that is just to me a weak tale. Just trying to describe to us things that are just beyond our understanding. But that still came from Seth. That's what Seth said about uh, all that is, that we're, 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 we're all, all that is, we're all connected to all that is. We are a part of all that is. If, if all that is didn't like individuals, it wouldn't have created them. We are individuals and we're all a part of all that is. But, but, but what keeps it all orchestrated? How, how is, who's keeping it a, a record? What is in charge of making it, the consciousness of the past lives? I, I would, keeping I would it moving? just think it's consciousness. It's its, it's own being. It doesn't, 
we're in charge as much as anything else from a thousand years ago or a thousand years from here. We're all in charge collectively. Do you think that the information that came through Seth, through Jane Roberts, was just a grain of sand on an infinite beach? I, I think that you have to answer that question in two ways. On one level, it's a grain of sand on an infinite beach, but if you're on that grain of sand, it's the whole multi-universes. That there's much more to the grain of sand than, than when you see it as part of one piece of gra one sand on the beach. Do you think in hundreds of years' time that there'll be higher levels of information than what even Seth brought through that's with us? Higher levels? More. I, there's, I think that as human beings, and it could happen today, and it probably is, the more a person is just open to more information, that more information is out there and will come. Um, I think that what Seth covered about things we've talked about, I don't think they, they could, there's not going to be more to, you know, you're dead right now as you'll ever be a time is simultaneous. There might be better explanations of that. I think what definitely there'll be more of is where do you go when you leave the reincarnational cycle behind? What is that experience like? Most people, don't entities, whatever, either don't get into it or I just find, and I could be wrong, I just find what they say just not, not that great. I just, so I think that what Seth tells us, yeah, is, is a grain of sand on a beach. Simultaneously, the grain of sand is a universe as William Blake said, right? To see the world in a grain of sand. And uh, it, just to me, it feels like there's something that, that's beyond all that. Well, beyond the sand? Beyond what we've... There's something beyond everything. You said a grain of sand on a beach. Yeah. And there's something beyond that beach. Right. There's that's something not, beyond that's that. That's not been brought through. There's some, that's not even dreamed of to be possible to be brought through. There's an, I believe, there's just never ending... There's a, an infinite number of levels of reality that are mostly not physical. So when Seth talks about, uh, uh, what, what was it, framework one and two, there's probably much more than yeah. other frameworks. He mentioned somewhere something about a framework three. I'm not that into numbers and these labels, but I would say, yeah, that there's an infinite number of them. You know, like with quantum physics or superstring or whatever, they talk about 13 dimensions. Yeah. Now, what I'm interested in, if you, if you could travel somehow into those dimensions, will you see a world? Will you see people that to them, they're the universe, and they're walking around, everything is, you know, normal sized, but to us, it's a tiny microscopic thing. I believe that's, that exists, that that's, that would, if it able to, if science could find it, that's what they would find. That's only the 13 dimensions. You know, each dimension might be have be an infinite number of dimensions anyway. But but we could just bring this back as well and say that maybe by looking out further, it does come back more into present moment. But just bringing this conversation into present moment as well, that you know, most of these Seth books, you know, you could go over and over and over and still find more information in there. Oh, I always do. It's like, it's like oh, I never saw that. How could that be there? You know, and but you know, the Seth books and Seth. He is here, or was here, specifically to deal with us humans experiencing physical reality now. He wasn't here to, you know, even though he said things about other dimensions and everything, his basic purpose was to, for us to enjoy physical reality, realize its significance and importance, and to realize you create your own reality, etc. His whole thing was to talk about physical reality and how it's spiritual, and they're the same. Has the planet Earth changed much since the Seth materials come out? Well, first I would say, um, according to Seth, you know, there were many, a number of planet Earths that were destroyed, or that civilizations that were destroyed, or maybe Earths that were destroyed, I don't know. I don't think in our lifetime, and when I'm saying our lifetime, I'll mean two things. I mean in our lifetime in the 19, you know, 1900s and the 2000s, but I think going back a, a thousand years or so, I don't think when it comes to consciousness, much has changed. I think people's awareness has changed so they could expand their, they're willing to allow more things in, but that they, that they haven't, that, that the mechanism of consciousness hasn't changed. So we could, you know, the same way at one time people were real, you know, prejudiced against some group, and now that prejudice would be laughed at, nobody would feel that way. 
it's not like the people became less prejudiced. It's just that their mind expanded enough to realize that prejudice was silly. Okay. So um, what would you say is the most important message of the Seth material? No, the, so important, the most important message overall is what I had said before, that um, we, the whole purpose of the physical reality is to learn that you create your own reality through the law of attraction. And in so doing, you are to help and not harm others. And once that's learned, you leave the reincarnational cycle behind. Other people that say they're channeling Seth, what would you say about that? Okay, generally speaking, I do have these quotes here, I'm not going to read them, there's uh, I think 11 of them. Seth, Jane and Rob, but mostly Seth and Jane, clearly said that he's only going to communicate via Jane in order to maintain the authenticity and the integrity of the material. That's not a spiritual idea. That's a common physical reality, everyday idea. That if somebody pretended to be you, let's say, used your name, Kevin, posted, sent emails to people, posted to people, all claiming to be you, they used your picture, and they said things sometimes you agreed with, sometimes things you didn't agree with but were really interesting, sometimes things you definitely would never say or think. But everybody would see all over the world were receiving emails from Kevin Moore. Your material, your actual emails, your thoughts, your beliefs, will get lost in the mix. Eventually a point in time will come and you'll be dead. All will be exist are all these emails but from Kevin Moore and nobody would be able to distinguish between them if they even thought to try. So Kevin, your material, which means your ideas, your thoughts, would lose its integrity and lose its authenticity. But if you said to everybody, which was Seth said and Jane said, people have to know that my material is only going to come through Jane. That's how it's going to maintain its integrity and its authenticity. And he clearly said it. And people won't, not everybody, but there's too many people, in my opinion, just won't accept it. They so, they're so hungry for a Seth in their lives that they'll just disregard it. They'll come up with the craziest theories. He changed his mind, meaning he doesn't care about the, his, the integrity anymore. Or, or I, I, I don't know what they say. During Jane's lifetime, people said this, you know, he's communicating through me and this and that, and Seth said, no, I'm not. You're using me as a symbol, and that's what I believe is happening with most of these people. But he said, you know, again, his material isn't unique. You don't need a Seth. Any pure, honest medium will come up with the same type of material, you know. You don't need the name Seth, and before Jane, there was no Seth. Suddenly after Jane, there's a million Seths. Um, so, yeah, so I don't think any, I, I don't believe the people are channeling Seth. I think that they either are fooling themselves or purposely fooling others. Now, of course, I've come uh, into contact with a lady called Cass. Uh, you've watched the video today as well, before we started this recording. And now she's stating that, uh, well, that there's a group coming through her a group that's called Seth. Well, she's, she, this is stated under regression, mm -hmm. okay? So it's not her physically stating it. This is when she under, is under regression. You know, it's the, the, there's a Seth group. Now, was it ever mentioned in, with Jane at any time that this, there was a group, that Seth was more than, it was multidimensional? Yes, and he used the word group. They called it a gestalt. One of the things in here that I won't be able to find out is that we sent Seth to you we. we we sent Seth to you, but Seth, as whatever came through Jane is Seth, that's, that's Seth. The lady you're talking about, Cass, I agree with what she said when she said, I'm an aspect of that, but I am not the Seth that came through Jane. My question was, still is, why use the name Seth? Because Seth himself said, I'm nameless, you could call me Seth if you want, but I have no name. Before, if Seth was sent out throughout the ages, or this group was sent out throughout the ages, which I believe it was, why are there not hundreds or not more of Seths from the 1800s to 1700s? We're all Seth, Seth here, Seth there, because they came out with different names. And they came out also sometimes through automatic writing, speaking different ways. But Seth was the name that was used through Jane, and it was a particular aspect or 
personality or entity of this whole group, but if you will. Before I met Cass, I'd never heard of Seth or the idea that Seth was part of a group. My thinking of the Seth material was this was an alone entity, a bit like Bashar. Yeah. But then, no, actually, Bashar, I think, I think he might be part of a group. Thinking it's about it, it's both. Seth, besides being part of a group, you're part of a group. We're all part of a group. But also, Seth had m many personalities on Earth, and many, you know, many lifetimes. Yeah, I mean, I've taken some quotes out of different Seth books. Uh, you know, give us a moment while we connect with you. Um, okay, that's from one of the books. That's session one, seven hundred one. Uh, give us a moment. Again, uh, Unknown Reality, Volume 2. Uh, good evening, good evening, Seth. Now give us a moment. Us, us, us. Always spoke softly as well sometimes. Mm -hmm. it, it, that, that, I, I had to look at the Seth material just to dig that out because then I, when, when I met Cass, I was like, oh, there is a little bit of a correlation there. But, but you know, times change, don't they? And, and the, the, I mean, the me now, if I was the me... You know, which is impossible, but in, in Jane Roberts' time, I'd be doing a very different type of documentary. I may not be using the flavor of language I'm using now because we know more. It, it doesn't. Not, when, when first of all, give us a moment could mean anything. It could mean give me and Jane a moment. It give could. Us a moment. It could. Um, I, I never, but it might not. And, yeah, but you know, you could, most of the time when Seth speaks, not all the time, and I have some in here when you read it, he talks about himself. I mean, he talks in the I or, 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 or whatever. The, the fact of some kind of greater entity is not that important. It's almost like, yeah, you have a fam regular family on Earth. So what? I mean, you're, you're still you. You're not your but, mother, you're but, not your but, father. You're but not, by uh, listening back to Cass's material, the difference I found is it's very, most of it, not all of it, most of it is aligned to that good material of the Seth material, right? Just from what I've heard. I've only, I've only heard what mm -hmm. you've heard, right? And that being the case, then this group must be, you know, I mean, you know, if I want relationship advice from someone that's not had done, had great relationships, I don't know if I'm going to go see that person. But that, that if there's something from that same Seth group, then I'm guessing from my own, you know, from logic that, that it would have, have good advice because it's from that same family. Yeah. OK, well, yeah, I believe that there is what she calls a Seth group. That's not that is, you know. Almost, it's, it's like, a, again, it's an analogy, but if there was like a team and the team sends out different people to yes. teach baseball or whatever it is, you know, they, they learn the same, they all know baseball the same, but they go out and they teach it in their way and they all have separate, you know, That's they're all I'm separate saying. beings. Yeah. So the idea that, you know, one person going out is named, you know, Billy Smith, somebody else is going out is named John Jones. You know, they're not all Billy Smith, even though they came from this, they learned about baseball the same. But do you think, because you're uh, protective and I don't blame you, or maybe you're not, but, uh, we, 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 but we want to make sure the materials um, of the cemetery material is carried forward, no, right? I'm going to you know tell you I mean? why, I'm sorry I interrupted you. If what you're saying is true, there would have been Seths throughout time, before Jane ever was around, they, these people from this, quote, Seth group, would have come out and have said, I am Seth. When Seth did come out, he said, I am nameless. You may call me Seth. You could call me, basically, but you can call me what I want. Maybe it's come out like that. So we recognize, to begin with, that it's actually from the same group. And then if I asked it again, right, maybe, I'm not saying this would be the case, but maybe as we both spoke off air, it would actually say, you know what, that's just a name well, that's been given to me. She said, first of all, Cass said there, or whatever the person entity was, I am not Seth that came through Jane. That's right. So if you're not the Seth that came through Jane, what is the name Seth? What significance? Was it to give us a level of the same, so that we're connecting to the same field, the same, the same, well, then the they same say, family? I'm from, the, I'm from the, the same family or I'm from the Gestalt. But maybe it doesn't matter. But, but what if it was for us to have free will to decide for ourselves if it was without having it enforced on us? I would ask this person first, why are you using the name Seth? Could you use the name Joe? Could you use any other name? But, but we have to just remember, and, and also, I know I've banged about this earlier on, but we have to remember as well that when she went to the second regressionist, right, uh, she had never, that, that Seth name was never about. It was when the regre second regressionist said, who am I speaking to when she was on the regression? You are speaking to Seth. That's the name it used. Now, Again, there's where did that come? Because people are aware, like she said there, yes. we're aware of much more than we're aware we're aware so of. So telepathically, there's she telepathic could have picked up. Yeah. communication. Yeah. 
the subconscious information, we're all connected. So the name could be used, you know, I mean, even on a more surface level, you could have read about it in some newspaper and forgot about it. But I don't even mean, you don't even need that. You could have never read it anywhere. But I'm saying there's nothing magical to the name Seth. No. And the name Seth only came through Jane. And then after Jane, there's a million people, and I'm exaggerating, hyperbole, <laughs> that said, I'm Seth, Seth is speaking through me. That it's Seth, 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 Seth. Never happened before. I am saying it would have happened before. Okay, if then. Seth is a key name. Okay, then. But if this is, if this is to help us recognize that one thing we didn't all know, and I'm telling you, as a person that was a tiny bit into Seth, never considered it a group. Obviously, I'm a guy that's met a few people mm -hmm. in Chandler's, and I've only ever met groups, but I never considered that to be a group. Now, if that is a group, right, which we didn't know before, maybe it's just use that name purposefully so that we know that, well, like it said, it's not the same Seth, but that we are, we know it's that group from Seth. If it came and said, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm Kevin, right, then I'm not going to be too sure if that's from that same group, I'm not, I'm not going to be as like, oh, it's from the... say it. Oh, I mean, you know, remember the movie Spartacus? You know, at the yes. end, they go, I'm Spartacus, I'm Spartacus. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, I'm Seth, I'm Seth, we're all Seth. <laughs> but, but I would that, say, but, but, with this she yeah. said, if I came mm -hmm. through again mm -hmm. and whatever mm -hmm. I know, mm -hmm. I would say I am part of the Seth group, but I, my name is, is John. I, um, I come, you know, I, I'm a I see your point of friend. view, do you know that? I see your point, but can you see my point of view at all? I don't see, I don't... I think that if I said I'm from the same place Seth came from, the same trust would be given than saying I am Seth. She's not even saying quite she's Seth. She's saying I'm an aspect, a different aspect. Once you're a different aspect, you're different. Why? You don't need that name. You don't... The name doesn't exist. The name so, is meaningless. Okay. See, see how we're so caught up in the name here, right? Because we want... Because no, we're caught up in the name because Jane's work yep. had the name Seth, and there's an integrity and authenticity that if the name starts being used, even if the material is a hundred times greater than Seth's material, it would still contaminate his material. It would still lose the, the integrity of it and the authenticity of it. Even if it's great material, it's the work that this aspect who, who, did who, through who, Jane was done. Who, who says it's going to lose its authenticity? I mean, that, it loses is, is its it, authenticity, like I said, if 10 I, people I, I, would do I know, your emails. I know, but, 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 I know, but then you, got, you, you have to use your intu intuition. Does it feel right, what's being said? And I will say, oh. some of the bits in there, I, I'm, I'm not too sure, no. when, it, when it talked about you know, genetically alteredness and yeah, things like that. Yeah. You're mixing, I didn't say it didn't feel right. I'm not judging no, I'm saying you have to. Be, I'm saying you have to go with what feels right. You go right. with what feels hmm. right. When it comes to the with everything, but when it comes to also the quality of the material. What I'm saying now is not relating to the quality of the material at all. It's just relating to the use of the name Seth, which just is in a very everyday sense, like I used you as an example, by definition, it ruins the integrity and authenticity of the material. Nobody will know a hundred years from now what Jane Roberts' Seth was, or this other Seth. And if this other Seth says things that contradict the Jane Roberts Seth, if I was around 100 years from now, I'd say this is garbage. He's saying this in this book. He's contradicting himself in this book. The whole thing stinks. It's inconsistent. And I wouldn't even look at it. I'd throw it away. But wasn't it inter interesting that actually what came out of Cassidy in that one session, that you know, just one off, didn't contradict. Right. But there are things that Emmanuel said, most of them, as I said I liked Emmanuel, that didn't contradict it. If you're speaking the truth, in my, my terms now, it's not going to contradict what Seth said. But everybody can't go calling themselves Seth because they're giving the same message. Well, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but then I've met different channels out there where the message does contradict because, and, and you ask them why in a sense, I'm going to personify it, when you ask them why, this is just the truth where they're at. Yeah. There could, and they say there could be other truths. Of course. All of this is, all of this, it's not really re related to what I'm saying. You could have somebody claiming to be Seth or not claiming to be Seth. What they say could be in total alignment with Seth mm -hmm. or to one degree or another to the greatest degree and not in alignment with what Seth said. That, that's just going to happen. The problem is going to arise when, when people who are claiming to be Seth start uh, saying things that Seth didn't say, wouldn't say, and it's not part of what his material And that was. has happened. That happened with Mark Frost, with uh, other people. 
Um, but isn't it, isn't it interesting as well, her connection through Mark Frost as well? It, it, I, it's, it's interesting how this came about on the day it came about. I mean, for you. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that's you know, personal, that's, your personal story. Yeah. And, and you have your reasons. Also, she has her reasons to be betrayed like that and used. Yes, But yes. it's all tied into beliefs, beliefs, beliefs. And everything comes together like everything always comes together. Even, even if you don't see it as weird, you know, the fact that you're walking down a, a supermarket aisle with Karen Sm Smith at this particular moment, who you never met before, that's a miracle. You you couldn't have predicted that. But you see, if if I, if I if nothing's I, trivial. No, nothing's, nothing's trivial. trivial. No, no, that's true. And your your journey that this happened in the way it did is fascinating because it's a part of your journey. You know, but these fascinating things are also happening. Not that I'm not limp. Sure, it's just happening all the time. That's what life's all about. But, but you see, I don't want to support something that isn't true. That's the truth. Yeah, of right. Course. But if I found something that that I think's good. I don't, you know, I'm not here to, I don't want to dilute someone else's bloody material. Mm -hmm. But mind you, mm -hmm. it did say that it didn't want to do that. It wasn't, it, 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 that, that wasn't its purpose neither. I, you know, I, it, I don't want to do that because I could promote something that, that might not be just what it seems to be. And I don't want to leave, leave a legacy of like promoting something that's going to dilute something else. But at the same time, I don't want to ignore it neither. Yeah. Well, again, th this is kind of another issue of what we're talking about. You want to either, I don't know if promote is the right word, Not or promote, give, voice like, to. give voice to. Yeah, yeah you're going to give voice to what you believe, for whatever reason, the voice should be given to. And, um, you know, with this woman here, I believe, you know, she's very sincere. Yeah. A lot of what she said fit, fit right into the Seth material. Yeah. Some things, in my opinion, just did not, but I don't have further explanation about what she meant or why she said it. Uh, you know, that those bits were, and, and the, the, oh, those are the bits about uh, uh, people. You know, there's these creatures that won't allow us to do things, and they they killed our DNA. They destroyed us. They're going to prevent us from doing things like this. Yeah, it sort of victimized us again. Like not again, but it made us like well, we don't create our own reality mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. these people could stop us at any time they want. And we, we could have questioned that more, but it, it would take someone from just like yourself from the Seth material to come down just to yeah. to, to be there at that, that point to question that. But but then after that part, it went straight onto something that resonated straight again. Yeah. yeah well, yeah. you know that happens with everybody. You meet somebody. Oh, you like this person. You want to go out with them. You go out. Wait, let me just finish. You meet somebody and you like them, and it's great. And then after two months, you still think they're great, but you know you found out things about them you don't like. <laughs> it's the same thing here. But then, if this is there a different member, if this is a different member of the Seth group, for example, a different aspect, just call it that, right? right? Then maybe he, maybe this different aspect has got, has got a different, un, 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 you know, is is. If there are different aspects and have, they have their own beliefs, fine. People could resonate with what they like. That you know, that's well, they're different mediums. They're different people say mm. different things. People mm. who believe in evil. Mm love the stuff about demons mm, mm. you know of course there's demons you got to protect yourself from them well he wasn't saying demons but yeah no, I know no, what you're but saying, I'm but saying as an analogy yeah people yeah. have their audience you know yeah the, the, the oh, God, wait, I call it fear porn what fear porn okay but, uh, yes but people do have fear or joy people have their people are gonna you know speakers are gonna find their audience yes regardless of how great or yeah. ridiculous we're it, always a shepherd opinion, of a crowd aren't we be. somewhere yeah yeah, yeah. So, um, see, I, the only, t I don't care about anything about Seth, the Seth group, whatever. I really care about, in very practical terms, the use of the name Seth, unless it could be explained to me. Right. Um, is unnecessary, because it, it will ruin the integrity and authenticity of the material, no matter how great the material is, and the name is just not necessary, because the first thing Seth said about that is, I am nameless. So, and before, and they spoke throughout history, throughout time, and there was Seth never brought up before, yet whatever material came out resonated with people. So, I think, if I was to guess, and I'm going to guess right now, that this woman is using, the, the entity or whatever, is using the name Seth, because that's the way she could communicate better with that name. People could understand where she's coming from better. Right. But I think, I think, and I would hope, actually, if you ask her, do can we call? Can you use a different name? Or why are you using Seth? You know, 
hopefully she wouldn't mind being using a different name. And if that was the case, right, if that was the case, that doesn't take away the fact that Jane Roberts, Seth, was a member of the no, is, is a not, member of this team. Not at all. Or group. It, it, group. Yeah, Jane Roberts easily one hundred percent. I mean, Seth, Seth's Jane, Seth's Jane, Jane Seth could have easily been a member of this group. But to me, that's immaterial. I mean, to me, it's a big so what. Well, but yes, it could. Be. To other people, you, 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 it's you, you, not. You know, you know no, why I like it. Well, anyway. well, well, no, I, I just like it that if, that if it is right, which I think it is, that well. That's not a bad source of no, material. but as you said, they have their own beliefs. Yes. And I to told you and will tell you, I'm going to listen to what anybody tells me. It could be a two-year-old who just learned how to speak. Yeah. It could be a fire hydrant that, for some reason, I could hear. Yeah. If the quality of the material is good, helpful, resonates, to use your term, answers questions, that's, that's enough for me. I don't care if it's a Seth family person or entity or not. You, obviously, if you're an example, probably of millions of people who who enjoy that or think that's a good thing. Yeah. And I'm not disputing that. I'm just saying, for me personally, I don't care about a Seth family or not a Seth family. I care about the quality. What that woman said there, <clears throat> forgetting about Seth completely. Um, you know, I like most of it, and most of it did, you know, fit in with what Seth said. Some, you know, identically, just in a few different words. The only thing that different was this whole idea about. We're going to stop you, and we, you know. On the one hand, she said we don't, we're not going to interfere with you, but we're not going to interfere with these people who are going to interfere with you. Is basically remember that part? Yes. She said there are these entities uh, yes. that are going to interfere yes. with you. Yes. We're not going to interfere with you, but we're not going to interfere with them interfering with you. Which means, in a sense, well, then we're interfering with you. I just don't believe this cowboy and Indian world of fighting or interference. Yeah, and, going and, on. And, and and you know, now watching it back myself, that was one little bit that I don't understand and that maybe makes me feel mm, not sure about that and you know but but uh, but that would be the only part yeah, yeah. I would agree with and that's you. okay yeah it doesn't have to be a hundred percent in my opinion you know but the thing is about you know well, Seth a hundred percent for you all the time the, I, Seth never said the Seth yes I would say but not because it was Seth there are things I don't care about like he said you should sleep facing north or whatever the direction was, or you should eat at certain times a day, you should sleep. But you didn't care for something. I don't that. care about no. that. I, I don't know. But the, the main idea, Seth never said something, and you know, you might find that in anything you read, that I said, that just sounds ridiculous. Now, everything fit into my own way of thinking, it connected the pieces. Everything that woman said also did up until that time, and it just didn't resonate. This sounded like this. This was not, you know, because in the Seth material, one of the major things is, you know, the, it's a safe universe. The universe is playful like a kitten. The, you're not in danger. You know, it's, it's, it's safe, 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 safe. Good, 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 good. You create your own reality, beliefs, and then this comes along. Oh, they were so bad, we had to destroy them. As opposed to they were so bad, they destroyed themselves, which I think probably did happen. That's a big difference. Allowing a race, a race of humans. To, let's say they had nuclear weapons at the time, you know, five, ten million years ago. Allowing them to destroy themselves makes total sense because there is this non-interference type of thing. So, yeah, maybe the human race destroyed itself. But that somebody from the outside came along and said, no, this isn't right, we're cutting you out. I, I just don't buy it. I don't buy it. You know, I'm ready to hear arguments. Uh, but from what I've heard so far, I just don't believe it. And it doesn't matter that I don't believe it, but I don't believe it. It's, it doesn't resonate. It doesn't fit. You know, I said these things, there's things that fit what Seth said, and they fit with that. It's not that only it doesn't fit with what Seth said, which is almost immaterial. It doesn't fit with what's in me. It, uh, you know. Yeah, you go from that space. Yeah. It just doesn't fit with my belief of the of the universe and of things, because I do believe the universe is safe. I mean, before I even heard of Seth, when I was 16, I, I wrote a poem in 1966. It wasn't the greatest poem, but the title was um, The War in Vietnam Has Love in the Background. Right. And that's an example of I believe in love. I believe that people were good. But, but, but and that things, and so, that idea that people are good and love is in the background mm -hmm, mm -hmm. does not fit in with, yeah, now we're going to destroy 
the race because it's so bad. I well, it depends how corrupt it went. But even if it did go corrupt, I they I, didn't destroy I, themselves. Yeah, yeah, right. I don't, I don't, I don't know if I buy um, a universe that was, you know, well, not you. Sorry, I don't know if I buy, uh, you know, a, a race, another race coming down. And just, but maybe w w were they talking about? Uh, yeah, they were talking about the Seth entity there, destroying. Was it the Seth? No, they weren't talking we about. We allowed. That. We allowed another group. Sometimes it's. I thought she said both. I'm not sure. We'd have to listen again. I think she said both, but at one time she definitely said it wasn't us. We don't interfere. But this idea of groups destroying, if you create your own reality and you're here to learn, and you're here to learn from your mistakes, and as well as you know the, your non-mistakes, you don't just destroy everything. I don't like the way this is going. You know, Five minutes from now, it could change its direction. It could go in a better place. People do learn from their mistakes. So maybe one of these horrible Earths or human species, if they didn't destroy it, who's to say in uh, two weeks later, some person would have had this great idea and would have turned everybody around? You know, I mean, that's what, that's what life's all about. I don't care where you're from. So that part, I, I just don't, don't agree with. And like you said, it doesn't have to agree with Seth. I agree with that. It could be what this person believes is true, which I do believe. I don't think you know that was making it up. That's what that entity, or whatever was speaking, through Cass, that's what that entity believed. I believe she was sincere. I just don't believe it. I don't agree with it. But I don't think she's making it up. I don't think it negates or weakens anything else she said. But that one part, I just don't go with. The same thing like when you, when you like somebody, you overlook the fact that they do this or that, but you still want to you know, marry them. What do I think about a universe that might have beings in it that 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 uh, are quite could be quite negative compared to Seth saying that it's just a beautiful puppy loving kitten loving no. universe? I don't. Well, you know, I like the idea of what Seth says that it's a loving universe. You, you, you sort of changed what he said, though. There are there, people aren't always acting in harmony with the love, compassion, and goodness. Right? So it's not like, first of all, there, there aren't bad people. Oh, I'm using the word bad, meaning that they're acting in harmful ways. But when it comes to non-physical, I'm a little mixed on this, a little confused, but when it comes to non-physical you know, entities that are evil or bad, I think a lot of that we create because of our belief in evil, that we are creating these entities for us to interact with because we believe they exist and they're real to the people who are creating them like the, your television is real and mine isn't but they don't have this universal real that they could attack people you know who don't believe in them okay so this is the only bit of discretion in in this what we've seen so far yeah uh, with, 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 with Cass and uh, no um, and I think this is a good conversation just, just you know for people to you know um, to, to, that, that if something it has to see with any material you've got to as, as well we do, what to, how does it feel does it where is it mm -hmm. if all answers lie within then then the answer to what this is it lies within for people as well mm -hmm. definitely yeah and would, you know, how it feels and then I would just still always question why the name Seth when before Jane there was never the name Seth and you think it's because it makes them feel trusting and comfortable and they they could relate to it. And I just don't buy that. I mean, I think that you could do that saying, I'm friends with Seth. Me and Seth were buddies. Actually, Elias says that or something, you know, that yeah. we are. Yeah. But they don't use the name Seth. Yeah. So um, that, that that's to be continued as this lady speaks yeah. more. Yeah, definitely. You know? um, with, with the Seth too, these are all claims of Seth too. And it's like Seth is to... Jane, Seth is to Jane the way Seth too is to Seth. That's what kind of, kind of Seth puts it. But some of the claims of Seth too are, you know, we form the reality that you know. We have spoken to you since the beginning of your time. We have inspired and helped those of your prophets who have looked to us. We spoke with your race before your race learned language. We gave you mental images and upon these images you learned to form the world you know. Um, we gave you the pattern by which you learn to form your physical reality. So th there's all this thing, you know. Um, we taught you to form reality, we, we, we blah, blah, blah. Um, but the thing that's interesting in here, well, not one thing, is only once Seth tried to make himself physical, back in like 1964, I think it was. 
And somebody, you know, one of Jane's friends was able to draw it, like behind the thing. And Seth then looked at the picture and said, you know, that's the best I can do, but that's a pretty good, uh, if I try to make myself physical, that's pretty much how I could do it. And then look, look what the painting, what the drawing looked like. Oh, yes. You know, and that's, uh, I don't know if the cameras can see that, but you could, you could always insert it. So there is a connection, I believe, between whatever is really going on with UFOs and aliens. And we're just getting the very tip of the iceberg. And at the time when there were angels and devils back in the you know, 1400s, to them, angels and devils were as real as computers are to us. I mean, they were real entities. And if you create your own reality, they created angels and they created devils. So they actually, I believe, you know, saw them. They were physical. They were, they were, they were reality. And they translated things, these type of experiences, into angels and devils. And then they, they you know, when you believe in uh, like technology, we, we now we have spaceships and they, they, they translate them into com the computers. But that's why I think this whole computer thing is that, that there's a computer generation and we're all part of the program, the computer programming. I, I think that's just the, mo the modern version of angels and devils. You know, they're just translating the experience into what the, the best of our knowledge of the day. Angels and devils were the best of their knowledge. And this is the best of our knowledge. But the real experience is something to do with these beings that, that are non-physical and, and are helping us. So Seth may be um, from another part of the galaxy somewhere. There are. I don't. I don't think so. Seth, that, these beings, I think, are beyond parts of the galaxy. Um, now I think that the UFOs are all different occupate. I think some of them are from our future. Some of them are are from other planets. Some are from other dimensions. Some are from other time periods. And, and I think all those things are going on. But these beings, now Seth himself is, uh, was an earthling, you know, ha had reincarnational ties with Jane, had different lifetimes. And then he has these non-physical beings that he's tied to that aren't from, I don't think they're from physical, I don't think they're from other galaxies. They're maybe from other planes, other, other dimensions maybe. Um, but we all have these same connections. We're all connected to other galaxies, not galaxies, other dimensions. We're just not aware of them, like the lady said in that thing. The, the ego, not in a bad sense, but the focus we have using our ego, which we need to be alive, but that focus blocks out a lot of stuff. And a lot of times it's good that it blocks it out because we wouldn't be able to deal with the world, we wouldn't cross the street. But then it, it becomes a potential problem if it blocks out helpful information. You know. And do you think it is? What is? The ego blocking out help. help oh, yeah. The ego, I think, by necessity and fear, blocks out helpful information, and then it blocks out harmful information. But what it mostly does is its job, and its job is to focus on physical reality. And it's part of the inner self. It's not a separate thing. And it focuses on physical reality, and it feeds information to the inner self, and it receives information from the inner self. But that's its job, and that's what it does. It, it, we, our job as beings, as consciousness, is to expand how we define ourselves via the ego so we can then include as ourselves this inner information. So the, our ego then becomes more a part of the inner self. You know, like, like a country invades a nation and it takes over that land, you know, Germany took over Poland. Well, we want in a positive sense our ego to, you know, not to take over, but to take over the inner self more to become a part of it more. And then we, as we define ourselves more in this expansive way, then we're not going to block it because now it's us. It's not as fearful. It's us talking to us. So when, you know? you, when, the, when, when that picture of Seth was drawn um, and it looks like some sort of extraterrestrial it being... It looks just like one... Yeah. What does that mean to you? It means that I think there's a connection between part of the old UFO alien experience and these beings like Seth, these entities that are also non-physical, there's a connection that we still have no idea what it is. We only translate these connections through the best of our time period, you know, like the angels and devils. Or, and, and now the latest we do 
is that with computers and that, and that the whole world is a hologram or is a computer program because that's just what we understand. We're just trying to make sense of it all and we can only use our belief system. And, but what, what it really is behind the curtain, I, I, I'm not, I don't know. But I do know that uh, I, I believe it's, not, it's positive and it's, and it's part of us. These things aren't separate from us. They're a part of us. And, um, but I, I don't have all the dots connected at all. So with the UFO community is quite nuts and bolts, right? Yeah. But there is a consciousness yeah. side coming in most definitely. Yeah. But judging from the Seth material and what was drawn there, there is de definitely some sort of connection. Yeah. But like you say, we have not, we do not have the bigger picture. No, but some of what they said here reminded me of the ancient astronaut uh, theory some of the things that that were done and on that list i was reading reading to you and you, you could look at it um there is there is a connection and things that seth too has said and that seth has said fits into parts of what the um chant you know the people who uh, contactees have said and there's just a connection uh and with ancient astronauts as well you know, you'd like to think, wouldn't you, that an advanced civilization is also spiritually advanced as well. Yeah, but that's what I think. That's why I think this idea of warring, for these ancient civilizations that are warring, like the cowboys and Indians, ignores any kind of spiritual development, a spiritual evolution, if you will. It just doesn't make sense. It makes sense that we would see, that, see it that way or we would create it for us to experience. But I, I just don't think the universe is dangerous and I don't think that there's this battle going on that we're just one step ahead of or we'll all be destroyed I, I just don't believe that what was Jane's take on ufology or UFOs when she was asked those very rare yeah. questions yeah she usually as far as I know Seth a lot brought it up I don't know what her she maybe she didn't believe in UFOs or she wasn't adverse to like when Seth brought it up or it came up she, she didn't like wasn't repelled by it the most I could say is that she just seemed indifferent to, to, to UFOs. It wasn't something she cared to run away from or to explore. It just, uh, you know, I just didn't get anything, anything from her. You know, like when it came up, I didn't look at her and, oh, she's, she looks weird. She doesn't want to talk about that. So, uh, but that's all I know. Sue might know more. You know, Sue, who, she was like her friend and she had a lot of conversations with, I mean, they were friends for years and, she wrote a couple of books about Jane, called Conversations with Jane, you know, about what it was like being Jane's friend. So she might have some, some more insight into that. Are you still in contact with her? No. No. Sue Watkins. Sue Watkins. Yeah. I, think I, I think I spoke to Rick Stack and he messaged her and she said she didn't want to be part of anything. That I don't know. All I know is that she, uh, she did write Conversations with Seth. Those were two, a two-part book combined into a one-part book, and it's all about Seth class. Didn't she channel? There was another woman who channeled Seth, was there? Mm, no, not that I know no. of. Okay. But Sue Watkins wrote this book about, it was called Conversations with Seth, and it was all about Seth class in it. You know, she interwove the parts of the transcript into her observations and uh, other things. She used some of my poems as, like there's a chapter, chapter five, blah, 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 blah. But then on the bottom of it, like she'd use a poem of mine. And then, so she did that about four or five times. So I'm in, I'm in it like that. She interviewed people. I mean, she didn't interview people. She gave out questionnaires. So she used those questionnaires. So what I did, of course, was totally ignore the questionnaire. And I did write her like a 10-page letter about everything, but she used very little of that. So I'm, I'm very little mentioned in the book. I think Stewie Gould was my name. But, but my poems are in there anyway. And then, so it says Barry Gellis in the index as well. But so she wrote those books and she was friends with Jane. I don't know anything else about why she, if she bowed out or, if, I know Ricky did a interview with her for one of his online uh, conferences. But um, there must be a way if you wanted to contact her, you could. But, but, but there's you know, things here that we really some, at some point have to go through. Well, if you're beyond, in another dimension and beyond physical reality, I think by definition, you're gonna be involved with other galaxies. You're gonna be communicating with them. I don't think they have a physical presence 
I, I think that when a certain level of these beings are not physical, they're not going to have a physical, they'll, they'll have their own dimension in which things are physical to them, but that they could make disappear or make whatever they want, like the dream state. Like to us, the dream state could be physical in the dream, but then it could disappear or you could go through a wall. So I don't think that they have like a home galaxy someplace and that they live. I think they just live outside of physical reality. And other galaxies are in physical reality, even though there are other galaxies. You know, I think they're beyond physical reality. Other galaxies are within physical? They're in physical. They're physical. They're yes. other galaxies, but they're still on, in the physical plane. And some of these beings are from, are from other galaxies, I totally believe. And they travel here through, you know, black holes or through dimensions. But I think that there is a, also a group of beings or entities that are just totally not physical. And they're not from any specific galaxy. They're beyond galaxies. You know, it's like with the fish in the lake, we're not of that lake. We could put our finger in the lake, but we're not from another lake. If you know what I mean, you know, we, we're from something the fish can't even imagine, we could, whatever, and that is non-water or non-physical in, in the metaphor. Well, thank you very, very much for joining us. Okay, thank it's you for joining a, us. Yeah, <laughs> we. Yeah. <laughs> it's been a pleasure, brother. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much, man.